So I don't know whether you want to sum up what your current thinking is about how remote work might work in the future for us. Yeah, so I've been working on remote work for a couple of years um, before coronavirus. And it started because I live in Iowa, which is in central United States. It's a small, it's like a st primarily agricultural state with prob these problems of like declining population and you know what is what jobs can be done, especially, we don't have like a major urban, we don't have a big city. Uh, like the biggest city is under a million people. Um, and, um, and so I was, you know, there had been all these, this is sort of in the era when uh, Trump had been elected and there was all this talk about the urban rural divide. And there were a number of plans that had been put out about like ways to sort of revitalize parts of America that are not, uh, you're muted there, but uh, parts, ways to revitalize the parts of America that have been left behind by like agglomeration forces and stuff. And I just thought that most of the plans that were suggested were sort of too, I wasn't really happy with them. So there was like plans to sort of make research centers instead of in a few cities, make pick like 20 different research centers or maybe even just 10 around the country and pour research money into those places or you know revitalize small liberal arts college towns and or just give people money to move to the big cities. And I didn't think that these uh, were very good, but I thought uh, remote work was uh, potentially useful, like uh, pretty potentially useful. If you can do the jobs of the agglomeration economies without having to live in them, this is a way to sort of tether left behind regions to uh, the modern economy. And so I started getting into that and I knew, I had some personal experience working remotely for the, in my previous job as the Department of Agriculture. And I had been always paying attention to this issue of knowledge spillovers. And so I started looking a lot more and I, I, I thought that there was basically a good case to be made that the outlook for remote work was a lot stronger than people appreciated because I felt like the arguments for remote work, this is all pre-coronavirus, were fragmented across many different social science domains. And there wasn't, uh, there weren't people who had attempted to pull all the threads together. Like you have economists who are labor economists who study remote work directly. And they do experiments where they sort of see how well do people work when they work at home versus in the office and they do experiments where they randomize people to one or two arms of this treatment and they tended to find that remote work was pretty effective like often they would find more effective than people in the office so that was one strand of literature and they were kind of advocating for it but they weren't wasn't like they were super passionate about it then you had other people who were working on like online labor markets and like developing algorithms to match workers to uh, firms or you know, working for Upwork is this guy, John Horton, who's worked done experiments on the design of the Upwork platform to match remote freelancers to things. And other people who've looked at the effect of the internet on job search, and just all this stuff basically that finds that, you know, how does the internet facilitate job search? And one of the problems with remote work has been, well, even if you can do the job remotely, how do you find the job that's a good fit? And one of the promises of remote work is that you'll be able to hire just the right person for this job. And they're not local, but if you don't know where they are, you know, if they're not like, how do you find them? And with online labor markets and algorithmic recommendations, that problem starts to get solved. And then on the third side, you have people who do like study online social networks and they're looking at the, you know, the geographic footprint of our social networks and how that's expanding. And so whether these things let us like, how many of my friends live close and how many of them live far away? And I don't, I don't think there's exactly work on remote work there, but just the idea that people tend to meet people who live nearby, uh, but they, uh, when they move away, there's a lot of, uh, those connections seem to persist pretty well. And I think it's because of all the modern technology that makes it easy to stay in contact. And so a lot of jobs are found through these informal social networks. And if your informal social network is now spread out geographically, that becomes another avenue. And then the last piece of the puzzle was just that the knowledge spillovers I knew had been falling for a while. And so I tried to write a, uh, a comprehensive survey of all these different things and put them in one place and say, look, uh, the case for remote work is uh, a lot stronger than any one of these individual groups recognizes because all these things go together. And it's basically the case is that uh, the technology for performing work remotely has gotten a lot better. And so you can, many jobs can be done 
remotely pretty well. We've done experiments and, on different kinds of works and that seems to be the case. And even if I'm only 95% or 90% as effective working remotely as I am in the office, um, if you can find a person who's 20% better, you know, uh, because they're not local, then that's good for the firm. Or you can think about uh, if I'm only 90% as effective, but I don't have to commute at all, then like on a per hour basis, it makes sense for me to just stay home and you can change my compensation maybe or something to so that you're getting the same value for money. And basically um, I wrote the case for remote work. I'd started it and then coronavirus hit and I was like, I better <laughs> get this thing out quick. Uh, and then I feel like that has been like so vindicated that it's almost boring now. Like uh, maybe it's a little bit too, maybe that's too much too soon to say, but I think everyone's like everything that's been followed up. There's been a lot of work since then. And like, it's like workers are like pretty much across the board. Like it works better than we thought. I'm as productive. And a lot of people say they're more productive working at home. Um, companies are realizing this and it's just like, I don't know. It's like, it's a very weird case. I thought this was going to play out over decades and that we should like incrementally make policies that make remote work easier. But instead we had this huge shock that happened. Looking forward, I think the biggest unknown about remote work is about uh, the formation of social networks, like informal social networks. So um, right now we're kind of uh, riding on the capital the social capital developed from lifetimes of working in the office and in cities. And that has all these benefits of like, uh, you know, I, I go to parties with my coworkers and I meet their friends. Yeah. And if it's a city that's a cluster, they might work in the same industry or a related industry. And we build this whole network up. And that be, that's this really valuable thing because that can give me job recommendations. That can be a place I turn to for advice about should I hire this person? Are they really good? I'm sorry, if I don't have a, if I have a question about an area of technical capability, you know, I know people who I can ask. I am aware that there might be technical capabilities that I could use for some new innovation because I've talked about it at a party. And like, if we all scatter, um, which I don't think we're, going to all scatter, but you know, if, is that going to slow down innovation? And I think the big unknown is how much of that can be recreated with the internet. Like, um, so I have made a lot of professional contacts through Twitter uh, and just, and Twitter is in some ways like a, you know, a bar that you hang out and randomly meet people. Um, and the thing about Twitter is like a lot of the interactions are not as good as if you were co-located face-to-face like uh, they're more fleeting it's harder to form a deep connection but you are interacting with an order of magnitude more people and so I, I think we don't know to what extent those things balance out and then you know you have things like uh, you know other social networks you have um, conferences people go to and they could maybe do all their socializing in one place there and then you know meet a bunch of people and in the past, I would have met them, but nothing much would have come of it. But now I meet a bunch of people and we keep in contact over Twitter and Facebook and, or, or email. And so I'm able to form social, informal social networks in that way, almost as efficiently as if we all lived in the same city. And I think that we just don't know, like this is, this is the big unknown, but I think it is probably important. I still think that even if it turns out we can't form informal social networks as well online or, or you know maybe that's a big demerit there's still a lot recommending remote work because it has all these other advantages that are sort of compensating but that's my my current big concern about the future of of remote work is that side of it okay yeah i think that's fair i think there will be these compensating but the weak tie social network the serendipity mm -hmm. uh, and also for a category of jobs where you need um what I would say uh, you need to face-to-face -face works better. A, a classic example would be a master carpenter. So if a master mm -hmm. carpenter wrote their stuff in a book, probably you can't really follow it, maybe a bit. Yep. You probably can learn a reasonable amount if you followed them on video. So YouTube yep. would help, but you were obviously at a lot more if you can actually be in the same room and, and follow them. And there might be a class of the things, you know, this soft skill, knowledge, process, and know-how that you need for master carpentry. But actually, yep. that master carpentry category of jobs might be smaller 
than we thought, or rather that the category of jobs where the video is good enough. Yeah. yeah the video might not work for master carpentry, but it probably works for baking a cake. Uh, might not yeah, work and for chef, but it might work for these, these other things. I think that's true. The one other th note I would say is that actually, I think senior business leaders who, what I would say are maybe from more old school industries or have older school ties are uh, less keen on remote work. Uh, hybrid, yeah. I don't know, because I think that's where the compromise is, is, is going to be. But actually, so if you're tech Silicon Valley or you're, you know, whatever, like the CEO of Gravity Payments or Coinbase, you were on virtually remote anyway beforehand. You've done that. But actually, the CEO of JP Morgan, much more uh, reticent. So I don't know. Those are my two reflections on that. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, people who grew up, who became CEOs in the old system, obviously, are people who know how to flourish in a certain some domain and you wouldn't expect that they're necessarily going to be the, the people who would also flourish to the same extent in a different kind of organization. So that was one reason I always thought this is going to be a slow thing to play out because it would be led by uh, companies forming from remote from the beginning and then you'd have this cohort of ever-growing cohort of people who have experience managing and leading remote companies and they would spread out. Now we're in this weird situation where we had this we're having companies that existed and were set up a one way deciding to switch because uh, for, for these kind of reasons and they paid the switching costs in terms of they've, they've developed processes to do things remotely and they've uh, you know invested in the equipment. Uh, coronavirus forced them to do that. But you know, in some way they like, you know, being remote first isn't necessarily in their DNA in the same way it would be for another company. And as to your first point, that's probably something I should have said right at the beginning is like, I don't think this is ever gonna be like a hundred percent, well, ever is a long time, but in my, in the next few decades, I don't see us going like a hundred percent remote at all. I, I sort of target like you know, 20 to 30% of workers being full, you know, being mostly remote. Uh, and, I think that that's, uh, the thing is that's still a huge change. Like if yeah. you had some new industry that was 20% of, uh, of people and it could be done from anywhere. It seems like that's a really good thing for places like Iowa uh, and so on. Yeah. Um, and whole categories yeah. of job like call center to the extent that it wasn't gonna go AI and you still think actually, you know what? A person would be better than the person at mm -hmm. home can completely do maybe that remotely. Mm -hmm. Uh, on that. So I do think that's true. Yeah. And what you're saying also about the value of being face-to-face, uh, -face, I totally agree with that. That's one thing that I changed my mind about doing all those researches. When I first started, I was like, uh, you know, what do you, what do you really need to be face-to-face -face for uh, when, in the era of Zoom? It's just people being Luddites or something. But reading more, and it's just like it continually comes up again that even knowledge workers who are comfortable with it, they, they like to have occasional in-person thing so like you know wordpress has been fully remote for 20 years or whatever but they i think they have like quarterly things where teams get together in person because and there's a study of google and they have people working all over the world and they talk about how valuable it is to have when you're starting a new project get everybody in one place to get on the same page and then you kind of figure out the roles and the project the tasks that need to be done and then it's a lot easier to then that in a sense you're sort of like uh breaking the problem down into discrete chunks that then make sense to do remotely where people can focus but yeah i think that like uh fully remote it's not everybody it's never going to be everyone and it's not even going to be that people never see each other they just will sort of see each other intensely for short periods of time and then most of the time they won't uh, you know, at least in person. That's kind of how I think it's likely to evolve. And then, as you said, for hybrid, hybrid is, I don't know, it's a little bit risky. It's sort of, in, in some ways, it's halfway between the two, but you can you can very easily end up in a worst of all worlds situation uh, that hopefully firms are going to try hard to avoid. Because like, you have to live in the region, you have to live within commuting distance, uh, you're limited to the local labor population, uh, and you have to you have to commit to establishing processes so that remote workers can do things effectively. Mm. Uh, so you might as well of, be in person. It's kind of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's yeah. the, the risk.